As you can see, we have a star-studded lineup this morning. I'm not going to uh, read their uh, background material and biographical information because, uh, as Richard Epstein said to me, it would take much too long, but... Uh, <laughs> but let me at least uh, introduce the speakers to you. <clears throat> as we go across the, uh, the stage here, starting off will be Professor Michael Dorff from the Rutgers University School of Law in Camden, New Jersey. And next, uh, Richard Epstein, who is known to many of you from previous federalism conferences and certainly is a great supporter of the organization. Uh, Michael Perry from Northwestern University School of Law here at home, uh, whose uh, book was referred to yesterday in the proceedings. And finally, Stephen Smith from the University of Colorado School of Law. Before calling on our speakers to each uh, talk to you for 12 to 14 minutes, um, and then, of course, we'll turn it uh, over for your questions. Let me just make a few comments. At the outset, I think it's important to remember one of the things that was sporadically mentioned yesterday, and that is the fact that the Constitution is, in fact, a law, and thus a legal document. And therefore, it is susceptible to construction or interpretation as any other law or legal document would be. The fact that it is a very special law and that its construction may have far-ranging consequences only means that we must be perhaps more careful in how we go about that task. Secondly, I'd like to suggest that we ought to recognize, despite what might be inferred from some of the speeches that we've heard, that we're not really venturing into uncharted territory. Lawyers, judges, and scholars have wrestled with this problem for quite some time. And I would suggest that perhaps looking backwards might be helpful in understanding the, prob the issue of originalism and the problems of construction of the Constitution. It might be worthwhile then to look back at some of the authoritative sources who have viewed this matter before, during, and immediately following the drafting and ratification of the Constitution and the first 10 amendments. I might say that in looking to the past, I'm particularly indebted personally to my former colleague and good friend, Gary McDowell, who's known to many of you and has been an active supporter of the Federalist Society. Uh, Gary is now the director of the Institute of United States Studies at the University of London. And he is using his time in England to uh, do considerable original research on some of the antecedents of the uh, American legal system and the Constitution itself. So today I would suggest to you that the power of originalism lies not only in the intellectual basis for it, which is being discussed here, but also to a certain extent in its antiquity. This is not some methodology that's thought up to legitimate judicial power to reach certain politically attractive ends. Rather, it is a methodology that has evolved from experience. As long ago as 1527, in his preface to what was really the first true law dictionary entitled The Terms of Law, John Rastel wrote, the law in every realm should be so published, declared, and written in such wise that the people so bound to the same might soon and shortly come to the knowledge thereof, or else such a law so kept secretly in the knowledge of a few persons and from the knowledge of the great multitude may rather be called a trap and a net to bring the people to vexation and trouble rather than a good order to bring them to peace and quietness. Well, another useful source, I believe, is Thomas Rutherford, an English legal writer whose works were very influential at the time of the establishment of the Constitution and who was widely read and cited uh, both by the founding generation and by the first generation uh, to use and to interpret the Constitution. Uh, as you will see from this comment of his that I'll read, uh, he might well be described as an 18th century Lino Graglio. Uh, Rutherford's fundamental premise is a simple one. He said, the end which interpretation aims at is to find out what was the intention of the writer, to clear up the meaning of his words if they are obscure, to ascertain the sense of them if they are ambiguous, to determine what his, the writer's design was, where his words express it imperfectly. And then, in terms of those who were interpreting the Constitution itself, I would suggest that Justice Story, uh, writing in his commentaries on the Constitution, uh, had a relatively modest version of the Constitution and also of the power of judges to construe it. He said, 
Constitutions are not designed for metaphysical or logical subtleties, or for the exercise of philosophical acuteness or judicial research. They are instruments of a practical nature, founded upon the common business of human life, adapted to common wants, designed for common use, and fitted for common understandings. The people make them, the people adopt them, the people must be supposed to read them with the help of common sense, and cannot be presumed to admit in them any recondite meaning or any extraordinary gloss. Well, finally, as we gather here to consider the importance of originalism in our constitutional law, we should keep plainly in view the admi admonition that one justice, writing halfway through the judicial history of our country, saw fit to offer to his generation. Writing in the shadow of the Dred Scott case, Justice Benjamin Curtis offered a simple warning. He said, when a strict interpretation of the Constitution according to the fixed rules which govern the interpretation of laws is abandoned, and the theoretical opinions of individuals are allowed to control its meaning, we have no longer a constitution. We are then under the government of individual men who for the time being have power to declare what the constitution is according to their own views of what it ought to mean. Well, as Curtis and Story and the others knew so well, much hangs in the balance when it comes to the interpretation of our fundamental law. And thus, we, in this generation, are obligated to get it right. To tell us how to get it right, we now turn to the members of our panel. Michael. Uh, thank you, General Meese. I'm, I'm not so sure that I'll be able to tell you how to get it right, nor that I would presume uh, to try to do such a thing. Uh, I do want to talk about normative indeterminacy, though, which is ostensibly the title of today, uh, this morning's panel. Um, and I want to talk about it in a sense, I think, different from the sense in which it's ordinarily used. Uh, normally, when people talk about normative indeterminacy uh, with respect to originalism, I think they have in mind something like what you might call Dworkin's distinction between a concept and a conception, or to make it more concrete, uh, the distinction that uh, Judge Bork draws in his uh, 1990 book between the normative value of, say, the Equal Protection Clause as understood by the drafters and ratifiers of the 14th Amendment, on the one hand, the sort of specific normative content that they would have given it, and some deeper sense of the norm of equality that they enacted through the text. Uh, that is to say, the, the usual problem of normative indeterminacy is that a textual norm uh, is, in a very obvious sense, indeterminate. And one way that you can try to give it meaning is to look to the intent of the people who drafted it, which of course raises all sorts of difficulties about uh, the level of generality at which you consult their intent and so forth. Uh, that, I think, is the, the usual meaning of the, the phrase normative indeterminacy in this context. Uh, and people who are not originalists often invoke the idea of normative indeterminacy as an argument against originalism. That is to say, they say, well, if the point of originalism is to constrain judges, and yet uh, the process does not in fact constrain judges because the norms in the text are at some level indeterminate, then originalism fails along its, its own uh, goals. Now, I am not an originalist, but I think that is an exceptionally bad argument against originalism. Uh, and the reason it's a bad argument, it seems to me, is that as uh, General Meese says, the reason that people are uh, originalists, usually, if we take them at their word, and I'm, I think that's a, a good first rule of civil discourse, is to take people's stated justifications as, as reflecting their actual motivation, uh, is not simply because they want to constrain judges against reaching certain predetermined uh, political uh, judgments. Rather, it has to be because of, as General Meese says, some conception of law, uh, the idea that the, the meaning of law generally is to be found in the intent of the people who wrote the text. Uh, it's not quite the textualism that uh, you might ordinarily associate with, with that kind of view, but it's one, uh, I think, certainly respectable 
traditional approach to understanding what the law is. And if it turns out that uh, someone who takes that as their starting point, that is, they take the idea of law means the intent of the framers. If you take that as your starting point, and it turns out it's very hard to figure that out, uh, and that there are difficulties of interpretation that arise, that's not a reason to abandon the enterprise. That's a reason to work very hard at it, to try to track down the sources and do the best that you can. Uh, so I don't think that the normal sense of normal in normative indeterminacy is a reason to reject originalism. Now, I, on the other hand, do think that there are good reasons not to be an originalist in the conventional sense, that is, looking to the intent of the framers, ratifiers, et cetera, at a fairly specific level as a way of constraining uh, judges' modern decisions. It's not my goal today uh, to try to convince you that that is the appropriate approach to constitutional interpretation. First of all, I don't think I could do it, and second of all, I certainly don't have the time to do it. Uh, let me just say, though, why it is, I think, that uh, people like myself who are not originalists uh, reject originalism. That is, let me identify the premise of someone who rejects uh, originalism. And, and the basic premise is this. Uh, it's, I, I think the, the, the nicest recent statement I've seen of it is in an article in the March edition of the Yale Law Journal uh, by Jed Rubenfeld, in which what Rubenfeld says is that the problem with originalism as a, uh, as a, a fir initial matter is that it substitutes one counter-majoritarian difficulty for another. Uh, that is, it says it, it empowers judges to override modern majorities in the name of old majorities. And the question is, well, if we're going to have a majoritarian uh, principle at, at the root, why should it be an old one rather than a more modern one? Now, Rubenfeld goes on to state quite accurately, I think, uh, that that doesn't mean that you have to accept a sort of you know, the living constitution notion, because if you take a more modern view and say, well, we should, we should substitute the fundamental sense of the people as understood uh, in a contemporary setting, then you also have a counter-majoritarian difficulty, which is why are the judges better qualified to do that than other folks, uh, particularly the political branches. Uh, what Rubenfeld says, and I think what I've said in, in other places, is that uh, the answer to this puzzle uh, has to be some intergenerational consensus about what the Constitution means. That is to say that what the framers and ratifiers, particular clauses in the Constitution as a whole, had to say is certainly relevant to the interpretive exercise, but it's not the whole story. And now I want to talk about uh, normative indeterminacy in a second sense. And, and it's, the sense is, is the following. Uh, most people who, call, who do not call themselves originalists, and I would include within this category basically every member of the current U.S. Supreme Court. That is, there's no one on the Supreme Court now, nor has there been in quite some time, who says, I believe that our job in interpreting the Constitution is to actually give effect to the intent of the framers and ratifiers in any given period. All of them, to a greater or lesser extent, accept stare decisis and will accept non-originalist decisions, uh, even though they might have reached a different conclusion uh, originally. So that is, they accept a multiplicity of, of legal sources. The question then, the normative, normatively indeterminate question I think that then arises is, how does a non-originalist who believes that originalism is nonetheless relevant uh, to the interpretive inquiry, go about using original sources. And the conventional answer, to my mind, is, is quite wrong. Uh, the conven conventional answer, I think, is, is best given um, in, I mean, it, it's, it's, it's ubiquitous, but I can give you two of the, the most eloquent statements of it occur in uh, Philip Bobbitt's writing and Dick Fallon's writing. Uh, both of them have some, uh, ha have done a very good job, I think, of laying out for us what are the modalities in Bobbitt's phrase uh, or the, the elements of the, the, the uh, the, I forget what, what I'll, I apologize to Dick Fallon. I don't see him here yet, but I know he's supposed to be here. I forget the term he uses, although I knew that one before I knew Bobbitt's. Uh, th that is that there are different kinds of constitutional argument, right? There's arguments from text, arguments from 
history, arguments from structure, arguments from original intent, precedent, prudence, etc. cetera. Uh, and here's how it normally works for both Bobbitt and Fallon. They say normally the job of constitutional argument is to make the different kinds of arguments all line up and point in the same direction. Now, I want to focus briefly on how one does that with originalist sources, because it seems to me a fairly uncontroversial, but in my view, controvertible assumption of this discourse that what one ought to do for originalist sources is ask the following question. What did the founding generation, either in 1787 and 1789, or in the 1860s, uh, think about the particular question, and what they thought at whatever level of abstraction, uh, is evidence for the view that the Constitution ought now to be interpreted according to what they believed. So in other words, if the framers and ratifiers thought X, that is an argument for believing that the Constitution now means X, a, sim a sort of simple uh, progression from their position to the modern position. That, it's, that kind of interpretation, it seems to me, uh, is rather inconsistent with the very premise of rejecting originalism. That is, if one is not an originalist in the, in the strong sense, then presumably one believes there is something problematic of ceding that kind of control from modernity to the past. Uh, and so that one could have a more, so that sometimes the fact that the framers believed X ought to, in my view, count as an argument for saying that the Constitution now means not X. Uh, and let me illustrate that with an example. Uh, and I'm going to use an example where I think the intent of the framers is crystal clear, not from unratified, uh, unspoken assumptions, but from the actual text of the Constitution. If you look at the 14th Amendment to the Constitution, a copy of the Constitution which, with which I always carry, uh, you'll, you'll see section two, which is now for the most part a dead letter, addresses the question of what will happen to uh, the, st the state's representation in Congress if they, uh, they continue to disenfranchise African Americans. But in stating this, uh, the section two of the 14th Amendment refers to um, male citizens 21 years of age. Uh, now it's important, uh, male inhabitants rather, of course inhabitants uh, will be more or less citizens for the most part via section one of the 14th Amendment. Uh, but th the word male is quite clear there. And so we have crystal clear evidence in a, another section of the, the 14th Amendment that when the framers and ratifiers of the 14th Amendment made law of the Equal Protection Clause, there's no question that they had in their minds some view that various kinds of sex discrimination are perfectly consistent with equal protection. This is not an argument from their subjective intent, from their specific intent, inconsistent with the general words. It's an argument from the text of the Constitution. Now, of course, Section 2 itself became more or less a dead letter with the enactment of the 15th Amendment. And the r distinction between men and women became a dead letter with the enactment of the 19th Amendment. But if we want to know what it is that the ratifiers of the 14th Amendment, which is section one of which is by no means a dead letter, then we have crystal clear evidence here of what they thought. And I suppose if one were asking the modern question, does the Equal Protection Clause bar some or all distinctions based on sex, the conventional non-originalist would count as an argument against saying that sex discrimination ought to be actionable, the fact that the framers of the 14th Amendment didn't think so. I want to suggest that on a, uh, a different conception of non-originalist thinking, the value of this clause is to tell us that sex discrimination ought to be um, actionable under the Equal Protection Clause precisely because the framers thought it wasn't. Uh, and the, the reason that is, is because they thought it wasn't because of the very kinds of stereotypes about women that they were saying were illegal with respect to African Americans and other persons, but that they made illegal through the choice of general language. And so to make this argument from original intent coherent with, in Fallon's term, other kinds of modern constitutional argument, one has to have it count against the original meaning. Now, one objection, of course, to this whole enterprise is to say, well, if that's your view of how originalism is relevant, you're not only not an originalist, you're a, you 
meaning I, uh, are affirmatively an anti-originalist. Uh, and, and I want to reject that interpretation, however. I want to say that original intent is relevant in the same way that history generally is relevant to our understanding of the Constitution. And that's not because, as General Meese says, I want to reach sort of predetermined political results uh, any more than I'm, I'm assuming any of you do. It's because I have some conception of what it is that makes the Constitution or any law binding law. The conception I have is that there is a modern consensus, or uh, to use Rubenfeld's term, which he thinks is different, although I don't think it's all that different, a modern commitment to live by the Constitution's text. Uh, and that modern commitment is not just modern, it spans more than 200 years of our history. And we must, in a sense, ha have some way of making sense of that intergenerational commitment towards making sense of the text. And the way to do that, I think, that's faithful to our constitutional history, is not just to invoke history and say, we must follow what happened in the past, but to learn the lessons of history. And sometimes learning the lessons of history will mean doing exactly what the framers would have thought on the exact question, uh, So, uh, to the extent that they address the question. So here's an example of that. If we ask, is there uh, a principle of separation of church and state in the Establishment Clause? Well, I think most of us would agree that there's some principle there, although we'd have certainly vigorous debate about the extent to which uh, there is such a principle. Uh, but we might say that the lesson of the religious wars of Europe, the lesson of that history, is that there must be some degree of separation. That's what I have in mind by the, the, the notion of a lesson of history. That is, the frame, and the framers were aware of that lesson. Another way in which we have, a, have in mind the the lessons of history would be the, uh, the way in which uh, Judge Bork says we need to learn the lessons of segregation. That is, the lesson of the post-Plessy era, or, or even the pre-Plessy era, uh, was that, as Charles Black later said, everybody realized or came to realize that state-enforced segregation was inconsistent with an ideal of equality. Now, these are lessons of history uh, that are at a fairly abstract level and also are clearly contestable. But as General Meese says, I think it's that kind of a judgment, figuring out the lessons of history in much the same way we figure out the lessons of past cases in the system of precedent when we must apply them to a new situation uh, that judges are capable of doing and are trained in doing. That is, interpreting the past to make it make sense for the present. Uh, so it's it's that kind of normative indeterminacy that I think uh, non-originalists such as myself and the Supreme Court ought to be concerned about. That is, making sense of the intergenerational compact, if you will, uh, and learning the lessons of history. Uh, and with that, I, that I think would be a nice segue into the, the second panel today on historical indeterminacy. But before that, I'm sure we'll have other very interesting discussions about normative indeterminacy itself. Thank you. Uh, this panel was organized in accordance with a constitutional principle that I think is not indeterminate but may not nonetheless be perfect, is known as the alphabetical principle. I think we are going down from D to E to P to S, and I am speaking second for no particular reason. Now the question is, what is the topic that we're talking about? Well, it is listed on the program as normative indeterminacy in the judicial role, and with respect to the second portion of that particular title, I don't have too much to say at this particular point in time. It's obviously an intention to say that maybe we ought to consider the way in which a theory of indeterminacy ties in with the ideas of judicial constraint or judicial activism, but I think that I would rather concentrate on the first half half of this argument, which is the question of just how indeterminate a normative or indeed descriptive term various kinds of languages or texts are, and to what extent does that give a degree of discretion or allowances for certain kinds of creative interpretations with respect to them. And in order to get to the Constitution, I think it's best to begin with a very indirect route. And instead of starting there, to just think back about the way in which ordinary discourse takes place when there is a disagreement between individuals about what ought to be done when there's some substantive dispute on the table. 
And my own view about that is for the most part, when people are engaged in these kinds of free form discourses, the sort of, the sort of intellectual angst that is associated with indeterminacy generally plays a very small part of the overall discourse. In fact, it's striking that the further you move away from lawyers, it turns out the less important linguistic arguments are, and the more important the question is what ought to be done or what happens is to the overall arrangements. And I think that that's generally a healthy sign because it should tell us something that we too easily forget in these kinds of discussions. That for the most part, we don't have any difficulty whatsoever in communicating with one another. That English is a pretty subtle language. That most of us are native speakers in the language, at least here, and could get our attentions across fairly well. And that only upon occasion do we find the point where genuine misunderstanding will screw up the entire discourse. And an ordinary argument when we start to get into these kinds of things, when we do make mistakes or we do have ambiguities or there are misunderstandings, they are not of a philosophical variety, they're of an easily correctable variety. What happens is somebody uses a term in two senses and somebody else will say, do you mean this in sense A or do you mean this in sense B? And the fellow will think for a while and says, well, I mean sense A and said, well, then I disagree with you because I think we really ought to do it in the opposite direction. And what happens, therefore, is that in ordinary language and in ordinary conversation, the problems of uncertainty and ambiguity tend to wash themselves out as part of the ordinary debate, and we get along with a remarkably high degree of efficiency in the way in which we tend to do, conduct these kinds of affairs. The question is, what happens when you start to make things into a legal argument instead of into an argument about general political discourse and so forth? Well, I think there's one very different kind of constraint that changes things. When you start doing contract interpretation or interpretation of statutes or the interpretation of the constitutions, there is now an external text out there which in some sense constrains the kinds of possibilities that you have. And the truth about the matter is when we're faced with these sorts of external constraints, we sometimes chafe under them and wish that the world were otherwise so that whatever we think to be the desirable solution to a particular problem is one that we could invoke under the can invoke in the, in the situation in order to reach the end that we've done. And it is very clear that if you put aside textual interpretation in its narrow sense and ask individuals today what their conception of government is and simply try to square that conception of government with the dominant sense that one had 200 years ago, it's quite clear that you have very different views of what a state and what a nation ought to do. It seems pretty clear to me that if you look at the original constitution, it was a system in which government was regarded to be a presumptive evil, not a general good. It was generally thought to be a situation in which the states were supposed to be the dominant players and the federal government was something which had enumerated powers, which were limited and well-defined. It was a situation in which it was thought that, generally speaking, that the best way the state could advance the social welfare was to get out of everybody's way and let them to do their own affairs. And then if you look at this and say, well, what happens when we come to the New Deal or to the general welfare state? It's a rather different sort of situation. If it turns out that you've got a problem Problem. It's a problem that has to have a national solution. If it turns out that you are asking about the question as to whether or not individuals are capable of organizing their own affairs, the answer is there are so many people who are victimized and marginalized and so forth that this is really not possible and that the state has to come in and provide some sort of assistance and redress for them to protect them from their own folly or for them the depredations of others. Now, if you have these two different views of the world, it turns out that you're going to have two rather different views of what government ought to do. In the one case, case, you're going to be a minimalist who regards government as a necessary evil. And in the other situation, you're going to engage in what I regard as a happy fallacy, which says, the more the better. Now, what happens when you try to put this up against a lens of constitutional interpretation? Well, it seems to me that what happens is that you engage, shall we say, in certain twists and turns with respect to standard documents in order to achieve a result which is consistent with the political philosophies of the day, even though it seems to rub very sharply against the original document. Let me just mention a couple of areas in which I think this kind of a situation um, takes place and then try to indicate to you how it is that one ought to deal with the problems that do remain in constitutional interpretation after some of the major mistakes are exposed. That is, to take one rather unimportant question. If you were to try to figure out the scope of federal jurisdiction under the Constitution, one would have to look towards the Commerce Clause to see what the extent of the legislative power is. And I have little doubt that if you had given the 1937 interpretation of the Commerce Clause back in 1787, the Union never would have gotten started. The thought that somehow or other commerce covered agriculture, manufacture, as well as trade and industry, indeed all productive activities, would have meant that the entire compromise 
compromise over slavery and lots of other things would have simply been shot out of the water in virtue of the fact that the federal government would have had complete and plenary jurisdiction over matters which at that time very much had to be left to the state. And so that what would happen if you're taking a 1787 interpretation is that commerce would mean trade or intercourse of one form or another by way of business exchange and navigation and so forth amongst the several states, an interpretation which it managed to hold for 150 years. And when you come to 1937 and you start to decide that the Commerce Clause has rather different meanings, it seems to me that it's not a legitimate form of interpretation, at least if you're trying to make sense of the original document. What's happening there is you've decided that the federal government has to be brought into play in order to answer large numbers of problems that otherwise were insoluble, or so it was claimed. And under those circumstances, what you do is you read the clause in a fashion which means that it simply overrides and destroys the entire form of the original structure. And I think that one of the great tragedies of modern interpretation is that what we do is we develop entire theories of constitutional interpretation in order to make ourselves comfortable with a set of results which can only be described as illegitimate if your only view about interpretation is to try to figure out what the ordinary meanings of the terms are in the circumstances of which they're used. And to give you, I think, an explanation as to why we know that when we're talking about commerce, for example, underneath the Constitution, we're playing fast and loose, just think about the way in which the term is used under those circumstances in which we no longer care about the constitutional question of jurisdiction and are only worried about the question of what does the word mean and how ought it to be understood. And let me just give you a couple of illustrations which I think show this. The first is we, of course, have a negative commerce or dominant, do dormant commerce power. And this is generally understood to deal with situations where even when the federal government is not acted, with respect to certain activities, it turns out that state legislation is preempted. And if you're trying to figure out what the scope of those activities are, it turns out it's the scope of the old positive commerce clause. It's basically trade and navigation and exchange amongst the various states. And you ask yourself whether or not that term proves stable over time, and the answer is sure it does. To the extent that one is now asking a rather different question, it seems as though the courts are quite happy to give the interpretation to commerce that it had in the original document, because no longer is the question of the scope of federal power when the government wants to act, something which is very much on the table. And similarly, if you were to look at a term like commerce, when you get away from the Constitution altogether and start to worry about such prosaic matters as land use planning and zoning, it's perfectly clear again to anybody who's been in the business that when people talk about a commercial zone, they don't mean to include industrial and agricultural zones. They do it in exact opposition to these terms because the ordinary meaning of the term has to do with retail establishments and office buildings, not with manufacturing plants and with farming. And that, again, I think is a sign of how it is that it's so easy to go wrong with respect to these documents. That is, when you take yourself a term which is under constitutional stress and ask how it performs in other settings where constitutional questions are not at stake, you know that you've got something wrong with your constitutional interpretation if whatever you do has to be followed with the words, for the purposes of the Constitution, X happens to mean Y. What you would like to do with your theories of constitutional interpretation is to say that the same prosaic meanings that you have in ordinary discourse are the kinds of meanings that carry over. Now, today that leads to a complete revolution, one would dare say, with respect to the scope of federal power. But it seems to me that you don't have to be an originalist. You don't have to be any kind of philosopher whatsoever to recognize that somebody stole the baby with the bathwater or some appropriate metaphor of that sort when these kinds of interpretations took place. Now, the second thing that I want to say, and I'll probably just end on this note, is that there are some very difficult questions of constitutional interpretation which don't lend themselves to simple matters of what do we mean by certain words when they're used in certain kinds of contexts. One of my favorite headings under the Constitution is the discussion of the scope of the police power as it is understood with respect to the various protections of individual liberties. And the first rule of interpretation, of course, is that we stare at the text and we find that this term is no where to be found anywhere in the Constitution, yet at the same time it has been the subject of four or five major treatises which have tried to figure out what its scope and definition turn out to be. Why is it that we have to do this kind of an exercise? And I think the difficult questions of interpretation are not those about the meaning of words, but those which have to do about the exceptions to certain kinds of fixed rules. But here, too, it seems to me that the Constitution should not be interpreted in any kind of strange or novel way. 
What happens is an ordinary discourse that deals with normative matters. Essentially, argument proceeds by an elaborate system of presumptions. If you ask whether or not it's a good or a bad thing to keep your promises, people will say generally you ought to keep your promises, and a good utilitarian can even think of explanations as to why that's an intelligent rule. But then you say, well, if you think we ought to keep your promises, do we have to keep them in all cases? And we discover, generally speaking, that we are not willing to say that you have to keep those promises when they've been induced by fraud on the one hand, or or by various forms of physical coercion on the other. So that there are various kinds of exceptions which are based upon wrongful conduct of other individuals which allow you to escape obligations which would otherwise attach to your own conduct. Now, this whole question of exception seems to me to be important, not only in the way in which you interpret statutes, but also the way in which you interpret various kinds of constitutional provisions. And one of the things that you ought to note is whether you're talking about the Fifth Amendment in property or the First Amendment with respect to freedom of speech. The protections that are given are only presumptive, and one of the difficult questions that you always have to ask is what kinds of activities can override the presumptions in question. And at this point, one has to indulge in a little bit of political theory that might not be necessary under other circumstances, but it seems to me that it's sufficiently straightforward that one can summarize the basic arguments rather, in a rather quick fashion. And here the basic point seems to me to be this. The kinds of things that we think to be generally illegal by most individuals are in a good libertarian position, activities of force and activities of fraud. And so to the extent that somebody wishes to engage in these things in any way, shape, or form, one seeks ways to counter. So that to the extent that you force people to make promises by force and fraud, it turns out there's a form of aggression which therefore excuses them from the performance of the promises that otherwise have to be undertaken. Take it. And therefore, when you start to figure out what it is you mean, for example, by something about freedom of speech, you don't mean freedom of speech to say you could do whatever you want. Rather, the stress is placed upon the word freedom, and what it suggests to you is that to the extent that you speak in a manner which is designed to coerce other individuals or to deceive them, then under those circumstances, your freedom has been forfeited by an abuse which is well understood in ordinary discourse. And huge amounts of the First Amendment could be simply understood by asking to what extent do you you're dealing with situations which threaten fraud, and to what extent you deal with situations which threaten the use of force. So you have the incitement cases, for example, and the defamation cases as kind of standard exceptions with respect to the basic structure of these documents. And then, of course, since there's a certain degree of uncertainty in all of this, now that you've figured out the ends, you have to ask yourself what kinds of means can be adopted so as to make sure that when you try to punish the excesses, you don't go overboard and kill that kind of speech which is protected. And so you have, by a fairly natural process of implication, a police power jurisprudence of ends on the one hand and a police power jurisprudence of appropriate means on the other hand. And if you go back and read your First Amendment jurisprudence, I think that huge amounts of that material can be conveniently be organized around this simple two-part axis. What is striking about American constitutional jurisprudence and what gives you some sense about the illegitimacy of the way in which we play the normative game is that the definition and the scope of a police power is not constant as we move happily from clause to clause. When you're dealing with the First Amendment where the judges seem to care about the liberties that are involved, we're told that the ends have to be narrowly defined and the means have to be tailored to make sure that no overbreath is going to be tolerated and that the least restrictive alternative will be chosen. The moment you start getting to the questions of property, now it discovers that we're reading a constitutional clause that's written not in red ink, but in blue ink. Doesn't matter very much. So when you start worrying about what the scope of the police power is, it turns out that any conceivable justification that a fraudulent justice can invent will be sufficient so long as a gullible audience is willing to accept it. Now, though, what I suggest to you again is when you start seeing those kinds of shifts in standards, between something which is relatively well tied to a fairly standard sense of what constitutes right and wrong conduct of individuals to something else which says that whenever the community wants to do something, it's justified in doing it, you have the seeds of indeterminacy of the wrong variety. And that one simple check that you could ask in this particular area parallels that which one talked about with respect to the Commerce Clause. Namely, what you want to do under these circumstances is that when you're talking about those conditions which are in defeasance of individual liberty, you would like to have a consistent theory which goes across from clause to clause. You don't want to have one theory of the police power for the 14th Amendment, another for the Fifth Amendment, another for the First Amendment. You'd like it to be generally understood that those forms of behavior which we cannot countenance in a civilized 
society, we cannot countenance in a general way, not in a clause-bound way. So that when you try and harmonize the unwritten part of the Constitution, you're obviously not engaged in a naive form of textualism, but it seems to me that you can tie this up to pretty strong theories of individual responsibility, and in so doing, eliminate much of the normative indeterminacy in which we seem to wallow from time to time. The blunt truth about the matter is, if in fact we were faithful to the original structure of the Constitution, and not in any kind of narrow and provincial fashion, we would have a government which is utterly unrecognizable relative to the one that we have today. And the reason why we don't go back to those kinds of constructions is for other kinds of reasons, not of textual interpretation, but of basic political theory. There are, I think, many people in this country who don't like the Constitution as it was organized in 1787, and those of us who do add 1791 in find themselves, I think, in a rather unfortunate, beleaguered, and distinct minority. Thank you. <laughs> Uh, good morning. It's, it's good to be with you this morning. I have some prepared comments and then I have some notes that uh, I was writing down this morning in response to uh, Michael Dorff's comments. It seems to me that there's a fairly fundamental confusion that inhabits much that Michael Dorff was saying and it's relevant to relevant background for my prepared comments. So let me just try to sort something out. There may be room for a, a rational difference in judgments about what A means in saying what A says, in saying what we know A to have said. And if, we're, if we know that A was issuing an instruction, a direction, then there may be room for a reasonable difference in judgments about what instruction, what directive A meant to issue in saying what A did. In that sense, room for a rational difference in judgments about what directive A's saying, A's text, represents, represents textual indeterminacy. One problem. Now, a different problem, normative indeterminacy. There may be room for a reasonable difference in judgments about what directive X requires us to do here and now with respect to one or another problem. Originalism is a position about how to deal with the problem, is, excuse me, it's not a position about how to deal with the problem of normative indeterminacy. Originalism is a position about how to deal with the problem of textual indeterminacy, and moreover, it presupposes a position about what textual indeterminacy inheres in. It inheres in rational doubt about precisely what directive the text in question represents about those who, those who issued the text, those who said what, 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 what they did say, meant to, what direction they meant to establish in saying what they said. Now, I, I, I think it's very important, um, if we're going to talk about, especially given the distinction between the two panels, very important to distinguish between the kind of rational doubt we have about what directions people meant to issue to us in saying what they did, to, to say that we can disagree reasonably with one another about what they meant, namely about what direction they meant to issue to us in saying what they did, versus once we've settled on a direction, a norm, the kind of rational doubt that attends the process of deciding what that norm requires us to do in a situation that implicates the norm to which it's relevant. And, and uh, maybe in the course of the, uh, the discussion this morning, we'll have occasion to pursue that, seems to me, fun fundamental distinction. But now, my prepared comments, and I want to make several connected comments this morning, but before I get started, I want to emphasize something about the points I'll be making. Neither individually nor in combination do these points presuppose, claim, or entail that the originalist approach to constitutional interpretation is or that it is not the proper approach. So for present purposes, I need not engage the question, what is originalism or the allied question, what is the best originalist approach? Were I to engage such questions, I could hardly do better than to take instruction from Richard Kay, whose comments here last night exemplify his important work. In any event, uh, 
The points I'm about to make are relevant and indeed important both for some originalists and for some of those who reject one or another or indeed all originalist approaches. I doubt my first point will seem controversial to many of you. The point concerns those legal directives by which a democratic political community like ours agrees to remove certain choices or options from the agenda of ordinary politics. Some of those directives are indeterminate, or more precisely, underdeterminate, in the context of at least some of the conflicts that implicate the directives. To say that a legal directive is indeterminate in the context of a conflict in which it is implicated is just to say that among persons who accept the authority of the, of the directive, who accept, that is, the primacy or lexical priority of the directive, and who agree about what the relevant facts and the other relevant norms are, there is room for a reasonable difference in judgments about how the conflict should be resolved. The indeterminate legal directives that most interest me are directives concerning what we now, since the end of the Second World War, call human rights. I, I don't want to get involved in an argument this morning about how many or how few of the directives concerning human rights that inhabit the Constitution of the United States are indeterminate in how many or how few contexts. Of course, one's precise answer to that question depends on the approach to constitutional interpretation one pursues. And if one is an originalist, one's answer depends on which originalist approach to constitutional interpretation one pursues. Moreover, if one is an originalist, one's answer also depends on whether one understands the originalist approach to be the presumptively proper approach to constitutional interpretation as distinct from the unconditionally proper approach. For purposes of the points I want to make this morning, however, the question how many or how few indeterminate directives concerning human rights inhabit the United States Constitution is, is a distraction. So as to try to marginalize that distraction, I shall illustrate my present point not by reference to the United States Constitution, but by reference to the international law of human rights. Note, by the way, that a national political community can agree to remove certain choices or options from the agenda of ordinary politics by ratifying legal directives established in conventional international law. Although, of course, that's a, that's a different strategy from the constitutional strategy. Consider in particular Article 18 of the International Covenant for the Protection of Civil and Political Rights. And the United States, by the way, ratified that international covenant, including Article 18, uh, in the summer of 1992. Article 18 provides, everyone shall have the right to freedom of thought, conscience, and religion. This right shall include the freedom to have or adopt a religion or belief of his choice and freedom either individually or in community with others and in public or private to manifest his religion or belief in worship, observance, practice, or teaching. Now, Article 18 further provides freedom to manifest one's religion or beliefs may be subject only to such limitations as are prescribed by law and are necessary to protect public safety, order, health, or morals of the or the fundamental rights and freedoms of others. Now surely there can be room for a reasonable difference in judgments about precisely what, at one or another time in one or another place, the public morals require or precisely what at one or another time and one or another place is necessary to protect public safety, safety, order, health, or morals. Therefore, there is room for a reasonable difference in judgments intraculturally as well as interculturally about what Article 18 in conjunction with all the other relevant factors prohibits in the context of at least some of the conflicts that implicate it. Now, my second point. In a legal regime in which the judiciary is charged with enforcing constitutional legal or international legal directives that are indeterminate in the context of at least some of the conflicts that implicate them, it must be decided whether the judiciary should play a secondary role or a primary role. It must be decided, that is, whether, and if so, when, 
the judiciary should defer to any not unreasonable, if implicit, judgment by another branch or agency of government about what the directive requires in the context of the conflict at hand, or whether instead the judiciary should resolve the conflict on the basis of its own judgment about what the directive requires, even if that means opposing itself to challenged governmental action that presupposes a different but not unreasonable judgment about what the directive requires. In other words, a Therian role or a non-Therian role are some variation on those. A minimalist role or a non-minimalist one. Obviously, different persons, different judges may well draw the boundaries of the reasonable in different places. What I'm referring to here is not an algorithm of choice, but a judicial stance, a judicial attitude. Although at the limit, one or another judge may always or almost always draw the boundaries of the reasonable so that they are substantially congruent with what I, the judge, believe, I think most of us recognize the arrogance, the, the dogmatism in that. There will be some occasions, perhaps many, on which we will want to say to our interlocutors, your position, I have to admit, is not an unreasonable one. Nonetheless, I disagree with you. I think you're wrong. My third point, for one who accepts an originalist approach to constitutional interpretation, the question whether the judiciary should play a primary role or only a secondary theory in one in cases arising under the United States Constitution could be answered by the Constitution. Listen in that regard to Gary Lawson, who, who wrote in his review of my book, while Professor Perry is entirely correct that originalism and minimalism are logically distinct concepts, he's, he does not explore the possibility that originalism can resolve the minimalism, non-minimalism debate. Does the judicial power of the United States, Article III language, as originally understood in 1789, carry with it an understanding of the judicial role that compels either minimalism or non-minimalism as a strategy for the specification of indeterminate constitutional directives. Fair question, fair inquiry. Let me just say at the moment, I'm deeply skeptical that a constitutional consensus was ever achieved about the best answer, all things considered, to the minimalism, non-minimalism question. Fourth point. Assume, at least for the sake of discussion, that the Constitution does not answer the question. On the basis of what then does it make sense for one to answer the question? Whether the judiciary should play a primary role or only a secondary role surely depends, to a significant extent, on one's estimate of the importance of the directives involved and on one's judgment, one's necessarily speculative judgment, about how things will likely play out, all things considered, if the judiciary plays a secondary role as opposed to a primary role. One speculative judgment about how things will likely play out consists in large measure of one's estimate of the capacity of ordinary politics on the one side and the capacity of the judiciary on the other, that is, their capacity as a general matter and over time, to respond to the directives understood as limits on governmental power generously rather than in a miserly way. Such judgments seem to me to involve generalizations that are, at best, perilous. So one probably has to decide, finally, which way it makes more sense to resolve the benefit of the doubt. Moreover, even if one views the capacity of the judiciary to respond to the directives generally, that is, the capacity of the judiciary we have, or are likely to have, if even if one views its capacity in that regard as regrettably weak, we can nonetheless inquire what capacity would we like the judiciary to have? In particular, would we like it to have a capacity such that it would make sense for the judiciary to play a primary role rather than a secondary one? Note, however, that as I emphasize in the Constitution and the courts, one does not have to answer the question about the role the judiciary should play, a primary one or a theory in one, the same way with respect to all indeterminate directives. Or as Charles Black might say, we don't have to answer it the same way with respect to all the branches and agencies of government. 
There may be good reasons for the judiciary to play a secondary role with respect to some directives and a primary role with respect to some others. Now my, my fifth and, and final point. I began by saying that the points I wanted to make this morning don't individually or together presuppose, claim, or entail that an originalist approach to constitutional interpretation is or that it is not the proper approach. Why then do I bother to make these points at a conference on originalism? Because I believe that the points are relevant even to those who are committed to an originalist approach to constitutional interpretation. Why? Because an originalist approach to constitutional interpretation may sometimes yield a constitutional directive that is indeterminate in the context of at least some of the conflicts that implicate the directive. An example? the free exercise clause of the First Amendment. According to what some, including Michael McConnell, believe, the free exercise clause, as originally understood, represents something very much like the directive recently established in the Religious Freedom Restoration Act of 1993, according to which, quote, government should not substantially burden religious exercise without compelling justification, close quote. According to the act, I quote, government shall not substantially burden a person's exercise of religion, even if the burden results from a rule of general applicability, except as provided in subsection B. Subsection B states, government may substantially burden a person's exercise of religion only if it demonstrates that application of the burden to the, uh, the person one is in furtherance of a compelling governmental interest, and two is the least restrictive means of furthering that compelling governmental interest. Now, I know that questions about the constitutionality of uh, this act are, are pending, but let's assume that McConnell's position about the original understanding of the free exercise clause is accepted by a majority of the court. In deciding if a governmental interest is compelling or not, or in deciding if a means is the least restrictive means of furthering the governmental interest, there will sometimes be room for a reasonable difference in judgments. In answering such questions, should the judiciary, in particular the Supreme Court of the United States, play a primary role or a secondary one? Should the stance of the court be Therian or non-Therian? And in the Constitution, in the courts, I've gestured in the direction of, of an answer to this uh, and, and related questions. Now, in my final comment, which is not really connected to the other two, but which I'm making because the person following me uh, is Steve Smith, whose work I very much admire. And I make this comment thinking that it may begin a conversation, if not for this morning, uh, it's cer certainly for later. In an article published in 1993 in the Virginia Law Review called Idolatry and Constitutional Interpretation, Steve asked what he called a, quote, fundamental and ultimately ontological question. What is a principle? Where or in what form can a principle be said to exist or to be real? More recently, in a book published earlier this year by Oxford called For Ordained Failure, The Quest for a Constitutional Principle of Religious Freedom, Steve wrote, legal scholars should try to clarify just what a principle is. As far as I can tell, nearly all judges and constitutional scholars talk freely about principles, but without having any clear or satisfactory notion about what sort of thing a principle is or what the ontological status of a principle might be. I, I wonder whether Steve isn't bewitched by the admittedly ubiquitous word principle in a way that's wholly unnecessary in the context of American constitutional discourse. If we talk, as I think we should, not in terms of constitutional principles, but in terms of constitutional imperatives or directives, the directives or imperatives that constitute the Constitution, the directors, directives constitution makers issue, whether we call them Fred or, or Frida or whoever they are, Smith's Ontological inquiry seems puzzling. What is a directive? In its central case, a directive is simply a direction, an imperative, issued by one person or persons to another. For example, don't prohibit the free exercise of religion. With respect to such imperatives, the serious question is not where can a directive be said to exist? One serious question for some is did they in fact issue the directive they are claimed to have issued, or did they issue a different directive, or perhaps no directive? 
Another serious question, what does the directive require us to do in this context, in which the directive is, as directives sometimes are, indeterminate, underdeterminate? Another serious question, and I think this is what Steve is, is really getting at, is the question that, in my view, Paul Campos's important comments here last night challenge us to address this. How can or how does a directive from a moment ago, perhaps a long moment ago, function in this moment in the ongoing moral discourse that somehow and to some extent the directive originates and focuses? And more broadly, how does it function in the life of the moral tradition, political moral tradition, religious moral tradition, that somehow and to some extent the directive, the commandment with others originates and focuses? Thank you. Michael's last uh, questions and comments make me wish that maybe I'd prepared a different set of remarks for today, but I'm not going to directly take on those important issues that he raised at the end now. Um, I, I should say, first of all, that um, I'm not a veteran of Federal Society conferences. This is the first one I've attended, and since uh, most of you don't know me, um, I would like to start off by telling you exactly where I stand on the issue of originalism. I really would like to do that, but uh, unfortunately I, I can't. Um, it seems to me that, that the usual theoretical across-the-board objections to originalism, that framers' intent is an incoherent concept, that we can never know the framers' intent, that we wouldn't want to bind ourselves to framers' intent even if we could know it, are troublesome but not necessarily decisive in all cases. In addition, originalism seems to have one major virtue, which is that it's not vulnerable a priori to the principal embarrassment of non-originalism. And by this I'm not referring to non-originalism's manipulability or to its illegitimacy, but to an even more basic problem that I think of as the problem of mindlessness. Unfortunately, given the way our history has unfolded, it turns out that most of the time uh, originalism suffers from that same embarrassment. Uh, not inherently, but simply as a matter of fact. And that may mean that the answer to the general question for this panel, that is, is originalism possible, may be no. Now, let me start then with an analogy that will serve to explain what I understand by mindlessness. Suppose that astrology were perfected into a sophisticated method for generating determinate answers to public or political questions. Would we want to resolve important political issues by interpreting and following the stars? Well, one objection might argue that the stars have no legitimate authority over us. Our political community has never consented to be subject to the stars. And this objection seems plausible enough, but it also, I think, neglects the more fundamental difficulty, which is that rule by astrology would separate governance from mind. Now, with a certain kind of upbringing, we might succeed in overlooking this separation, because after all, a sophisticated practice of astrology might generate virtuoso intellectual performances by astrological scholars of the highest rank. But such performances it would serve only to conceal the real problem, which is that the changing configurations of the stars don't reflect any relevant or directed active mind. The stars may, to be sure, reflect an active mind, but even if God has numbered in the sky all the stars that shine on high, still we have no reason to suppose that the providential mind that placed the stars in their positions was thereby attempting to address the mundane questions for which we are seeking answers. With respect to our questions, in other words, the changing configurations of the stars are purely fortuitous. So despite the intricate mental operations that astrology might involve, governance through astrology would still be, in the most important sense, mindless. Now this analogy may seem inapplicable to constitutional governance because we suppose that the words of the Constitution are an expression of mind. But this defense is available only so long as in our operations we actually treat the words as the expression of an author's mind. Conversely, if we choose to sever author's meaning from textual meaning and thus to treat the text as an autonomous artifact, as non-originalism attempts to do, then at the same time we separate the text from mind. Uh, with a certain kind of upbringing, of course, it's easy to overlook this separation because non-originalism generates virtuoso intellectual performances by constitutional scholars of the highest rank. 
It's hardly surprising, in fact, that non-originalism allows for more original and creative academic performances than does an approach which merely tries to figure out what the authors meant. But these performances serve only to conceal the real problem, which is that we have no reason to suppose that the words of the Constitution, considered as an autonomous text, reflect any act of mind directed to the questions for which we are seeking answers. I should quickly acknowledge at this point that terms like originalism and non-originalism cover a variety of positions. A non-originalism, as I understand it and use the term here, refers to the view that we should treat the Constitution as an authoritative and autonomous text, autonomous in the sense that its meaning is said to be, at least to a large degree, independent both of the conscious intentions of its enactors and of the meanings that we ourselves would like the Constitution to have, or that we would put into it if we were writing a Constitution from scratch. Not everyone who's not an originalist is necessarily a non-originalist in this sense, and even those who are non-originalists may not actually manage to treat the Constitution as the autonomous document that I've just described. So I'm not claiming that non-originalism actually succeeds in achieving mindlessness, but only that it aspires to mindlessness. <laughs> originalism, by contrast, seems to avoid this embarrassment by linking constitutional meaning to an act of mind, the decision of the framers or enactors that is thought to have been directed not to the exact questions, of course, but to the kinds of issues or problems that we're currently seeking to resolve. But even though originalism isn't inherently or in principle mindless, it might still be mindless in fact. The provisions of the Constitution might reflect acts of mind directed to the kinds of questions we're addressing, but then again, they might not. The framers might have been addressing different kinds of questions, or they might have written the provisions on which we rely without much thought at all. So there's no a priori guarantee that originalist interpretation secures a place for mind in the important sense. We have to investigate to find out. This investigation might at first seem reassuring. The problem of constitutional law might roughly be described as the problem of defining the content and the limits of government power. The framers of the Constitution clearly perceived that problem, and they devoted considerable thought and effort to dealing with it. So it may seem that their thought and effort supply the collective active mind needed to exonerate originalism from any suspicion of mindlessness. The difficulty is that despite uh, the wisdom of the framers, the original constitutional scheme seems to have been rooted in a tactical blunder of major proportions, and one which had the effect of directing the framers' thinking away from the kinds of constitutional questions subsequent generations have had to address. More specifically, the framers chose to rely on a single strategy, we call it the enumerated powers doctrine, both for creating and for limiting government power. Indeed, the framers initially had so much confidence in this strategy that they regarded a Bill of Rights as superfluous. Of course, opponents of the Constitution argued that the enumerated powers doctrine couldn't effectively contain national power, and it seems clear by now that they were right. The problem may have become most conspicuous during the New Deal, as Richard Epstein has discussed, but it seems that the ineffectiveness of this strategy should have been, and at least for the more perceptive of the founders, was apparent by the time of McCulloch against Maryland, and probably even earlier. During Washington's first term, for example, Hamilton argued that the Constitution gave Congress implied powers to create a bank. Madison's portentous response asserted that if Hamilton's view were accepted, then the entire constitutional scheme would be subverted. Hamilton's position would mean that, quote, the essential characteristic of the government as composed of limited and enumerated powers would be destroyed. In retrospect, it seems clear that Hamilton was right, but if Hamilton was right, it doesn't follow that Madison was wrong. Typically, of course, we don't grieve over the demise of the enumerated powers doctrine. At first glance, our serenity in this matter might seem odd, because one would suppose that the failure of an assumption that the framers thought central to the constitutional design might have catastrophic consequences. Yet, in constitutional law casebooks, the framers' reliance on the enumerated powers strategy is commonly noticed in passing, and the failure of the strategy is treated as incidental to the changing construction of the Commerce Clause. It's as if you got a letter from home that said, there's a little bad news, the weather's been cold, dad and mom died, and the kitchen faucet has started dripping again, otherwise everything's fine. <laughs> we don't view this particular failure as catastrophic, of course, because of a story we tell ourselves about the Bill of Rights. This story explains that the flaw in the initial constitutional design, that is, its unwarranted reliance on the enumerated power strategy, was soon remedied by the adoption of the first 10 amendments. The founders, we like to suppose, thereby supplemented their initial enumerated power strategy with a fallback right strategy, and as things have turned out, the fallback strategy has carried virtually the entire burden of limiting government. <laughs> 
I don't think the failure of the enumerated power strategy can be dismissed so lightly, though. That's because, in itself, the subsequent adoption of the Bill of Rights doesn't supply the requisite act of mind needed to support a sensible originalism. To see why this is so, we need to remember some familiar facts about the Bill of Rights. Despite earlier opposition to including a list of rights in the Constitution, James Madison was obligated by ratification and campaign commitments to introduce some such measure in the first Congress. But Madison was forced to, quote, beg the House to indulge him, even to persuade his colleagues to consider the matter. They felt they had more important business. Noting Madison's anxiety, a colleague agreed to postpone discussion of his own bill for establishing a land office, but he added with respect to the land office bill that, quote, in point of importance, every candid mind would acknowledge his preference. Legislators, it seemed, just couldn't work up much interest. Uh, they regarded the provisions as, quote, a few milk and water amendments, trash, nonsense, and anodyne to the discontented. Discussion of the proposals when it occurred at all was lackluster and apathetic, and the amendments were accepted in the states with similar lack of fanfare. What should we make of this kind of complacency? Well, we might, and some scholars do, react with dismay or even anger, blaming the founders for what looks to us like unconscionable apathy in such momentous matters. Viewed in context, though, the founders' apparent indifference seems more understandable. What their attitude shows, I think, is that they were still counting on the enumerated power strategy to define and limit the power of government. So they evidently viewed the Bill of Rights not so much as a serious fallback position, but rather as a way of reinforcing the enumerated power strategy by making its premises more explicit, or as a cosmetic addition calculated to appease opponents of the Constitution, or both. More specifically, the founders apparently viewed some of the provisions in the Bill of Rights as purely jurisdictional in nature. I've argued elsewhere that this was true of the religion clauses of the First Amendment. The enactors of those clauses were merely reiterating what they had asserted all along. That is, that the national government had no jurisdiction over religion. Consequently, they didn't understand themselves to be creating any substantive principle of religious freedom at all. Modern debates, which attribute to the framers a decision to adopt various substantive principles or rights, are therefore calling upon the framers to answer a question they didn't address, and hence to which no even casual collective act of mind was directed. Akhil Amar's observation that the First Amendment itself was, just, uh, was a sort of reverse necessary and proper clause suggests that a similar conclusion may hold for that amendment as a whole. Other provisions sound more like enactments of substantive rights or principles. But since the framers were confident that the national government lacked power to violate these rights or principles anyway, they apparently regarded them as window dressing and consequently devoted virtually no thought to the substantive meaning of the rights or principles in question. Now, lest I overstate the case, it's important to acknowledge here that in enacting a list of rights, the first Congress and the state legislatures weren't starting from scratch. In the history of Anglo-American law, these rights had long been discussed and fought over, and they'd been adopted in many of the state constitutions. So one might argue that the reason the framers of the Bill of Rights didn't think much about what they were doing is that they didn't need to. The rights in question already had a well-understood importance and meaning as a result of thought that earlier generations or the founders themselves on other occasions had already given to these rights. But if this depiction is accurate, uh, what follows? It seems to me that the depiction might provide a basis for a practice of judicial review in the spirit of a James Bradley Thayer with an originalist bent. For example, it may be that despite uncertainties about many questions of constitutional meaning and application, the framers would all have understood that government cannot deny a defendant the right to a jury trial in a murder case. So this kind of right would be enforceable through judicial review. In short, the constitutional limits on government would be confined to whatever consensus existed at the time of enactment regarding the content of the listed rights, is a view that I understand to be similar to what I think Lino Gralia was advocating yesterday. But I think it's also clear that we haven't followed this course, and in fact that there isn't much to recommend it, at least from an originalist perspective. Certainly the framers themselves didn't expect the limitations on government to be so meager. Inevitably, therefore, we've had to address questions that the framers did not consider and about which no consensus existed at the founding. Indeed, whenever we're forced to choose between controversial alternative versions of claimed rights or principles, never, in other words, whenever the problem of normative indeterminacy arises, we can be almost certain that the choice is one the framers didn't think about or resolve. Madison effectively told us as much. He reported that in crafting the Bill of Rights, quote, everything of a controvertible nature had been studiously avoided. So when controversy exists, we have no choice but to resort to other kinds of reasoning, common law reasoning, or natural law reasoning, or pragmatic political calculations, or something else. Of course, if we really cherish the label of originalist, we can still invoke it. All we need to do is find some hook in the original decision, the words used, perhaps, 
or some principle or value or concept that we ascribe to the framers, and then conspicuously hang these other kinds of reasoning on that hook. But the label doesn't really matter much. The important point is that if we claim the authority of the framers for one or another of the controversial alternatives, we're merely deceiving ourselves, deferring to an ostensible act of mind that never in fact occurred. Thank you very much to uh, all of our panelists. Before turning to the audience, let me ask as any members of the panel wish to uh, make an initial comment. Mike? Yeah, I just want to, I think I understood uh, Professor Perry's criticism of what I said was that to be that I was confusing two questions. One is the question of what the framers meant, and the second is and, and a question as to which there can be some indeterminacy. And the second to be the question of what we do with a modern problem um, when you know we're trying to apply what they meant uh, to our uh, modern context. Now, I'm going to respond to that on the assumption that I've correctly inferred uh, what my confusion is supposed to be, although I might be confused about what it is I'm supposed to be confused about. Uh, the, it, it seems to me that, that Professor Perry is correct, that I do want to say those are fundamentally the same question because the distinction between those questions rests, in my view, on both a naive view of language and a fu fundamentally anti-democratic view of language. Uh, it's naive because language in the modern understanding does not have a correspondence value. That is, when we say a word, it's not that the word corresponds to something in spiritus mundi, it's rather that the word does certain work. And you can think of this in sort of Wittgensteinian terms as the word does something between individuals. Uh, and so that what the word means does not exist independent of to whom it communicates. Now, of course, the framers of the Constitution in writing it were not simply speaking among themselves. They were writing a Constitution for future generations. And so the meaning of their directive is fundamentally addressed to the question of modern problems, at least in the sense that it's law. The reason I say that this is an anti-democratic view of language is because it seems to me that if we are going to take General Mises' suggestion at the beginning seriously, that is, that understand the language in its ordinary meaning, its law, people ought to be able to, to just look at it, read it, and know what it means, then that means that we shouldn't try to go back to the old days and say, well, you know, they had an entirely different understanding. If, it, if the Constitution derives its modern legitimacy, at least in part, as it does for me, from the fact that modern peoples and people throughout our history have at some level sort of tacitly consented to be bound by that. Now, I may have entirely misunderstood the degree to which I was supposed to be confused. I, I, I think actually the, the confusion was just recapitulated. What, when, when you use the phrase, the, the, the meaning of their directive, here's what I'm trying to say. There is the question of the meaning of their saying, the meaning of their text, in the sense of what instructions, what directive is represented by their text. Did they mean to issue to us? Did they mean to give to us? A separate question, once we've answered that, if we've answered that, is the meaning of that directive in the modern context with respect to a one, one or another problem. One problem, the meaning of their text, the meaning of their saying, what was their instruction, separate problem, the meaning of their instruction, once we've ferreted that out for one or another problem that engages us now. I, I think those the, are the, the Gadamerian point is a point about the contextual meaning and the process of specifying indeterminate norms. It's not a problem about ferreting out what directive the saying, the text represents. Okay, I was just saying, in, in the context of an intergenerational conversation, I think those are the same question. Um, Richard? It's nice to be in the middle of disputes which I'm not a part. Um, <laughs> 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 If even short-lived. Um, but I mean, I, I must say, I just want to say a couple of comments. Um, one is I think that the intergenerational difficulty in constitutionalism is like most difficulties overrated. Um, take, for example, a condominium association or any kind of collective. And the question is, you know, whether or not you're allowed to build without the approval of the board. 
Now, typically, these organizations operate over a very long period of time horizons. People come in and out. You chase a train of title. It might be 60 or 70 years. I have never been to condominium meetings, and I've been to a fair numbers, where somebody would ever want to say, well, you know, the question is whether or not if we reconstituted ourselves today, whether the covenants that we involved with here are the ones that ought to bind and construct this deliberation. I think the answer has always been that a law persists until it has been overturned. And unless you could show something that overturns it, you just simply ignore that particular problem. And indeed, you could not run the world in any other way because if everybody comes into the game at a slightly different time and says that it's the law of his own generation that governs, you've got hundreds of people coming in at two or three year intervals, and it turns out that what you do is you cannot have any form of common discourse as each person insists that it's his own generation that goes. So I think what you have to do is to show that the, is to start with the presumption as we do in ordinary private contractual and business disputes, uh, that whatever starts survives until it's been explicitly changed. And so I don't worry very much about the generational problem. Um, the second problem I, I don't worry about is what I would call the, the indifference or the ignorance problem. I think Steve Smith is probably right when he says that the amount of deliberation that were given to the Bill of Rights in Congress was not proportionate to the importance that the subject had. I know, for example, when I did some stuff on takings and I went back to see what they could tell me about some of the important questions of the time, what was quite striking about their deliberations was that the only thing they could talk about was whether they should do it now or wait a little bit of while. It was the prudential question of when it should be an act. Nobody bothered to talk about what this means, how it would apply, and what it all meant. But I think what that says to you is that under these circumstances, what you really are worried about is much less about what the mind was behind the words than what the words carry with respect to their ordinary acceptation. I don't think we ought to say that because they were thoughtless, and indeed they were, that the principle of freedom of speech is thereby denigrated. I think what we have to say is thoughtless people enacted a good principle. Now we have to figure out what it means. And then paradoxically, that gets us back to exactly the same kinds of things that were referred to in the other speeches, or several of them, which is the health, morals, and safety, the whole police power question as the way in which you kind of override basic presumptions. And I think if you organize the discussion of constitutional principles, the way common lawyers organize the debates. When are you entitled to use force? You're entitled to use it in self-defense. Are you entitled to use anticipatory self-defense and so forth? You'll get very far down the road to where, it, in terms of the basic structure of the document, and when it comes to the point where you're not quite sure whether or not the presumption and error ought to be in favor of too much control or not enough control, whether it's type one or type two error that dominate, you'll be at the point where the disagreements may be preferred profound and difficult, but the stakes or the amount that turn on it is very small. The difference between figuring out how much anticipatory self-defense that you could have in a free speech regulation context is small potatoes compared to the question of what we've done to commerce under the Commerce Clause and what we've done to enumerated powers. And I think one of the great problems that we have in these discourses is, as academics, we tend to take hard philosophical problems, which are unimportant social problems, whereas obvious linguistic problems, great scandals of constitution pass by without so much as a wink or a nod. And I would rather that we sort of, as it were, spend our time denouncing the obvious rather than trying at this particular point to elaborate the difficult or at least to be aware of what kind of game we're engaged in at any time when we happen to speak. Um, Steve, Mike, uh, uh, Steve, did you, did you have a comment? Mike, a quick comment? Yeah, I just wanted to put a question to Steve. Uh, and I guess in part this is because of my interest in, in church and state matters in his new book. Um, in his talk this morning, Steve said that it's misconceived um, to ask them to ask the question about the uh, folks who gave us the First Amendment, what theory of uh, religious liberty, religious freedom they, they meant to establish. Um, because all they were trying to do was enact a jurisdictional provision that would take the federal government out of the matter, out of the domain. And, and I, I just want to, it seems to me the historical point Steve wants to make is persuasive, but I understand, understand the bottom line somewhat differently. Why can't we say, and this connects with something Richard just said, why can't we say that whatever the reasons they gave us the free exercise and the establishment clauses, uh, whether they gave them to us for jurisdictional reasons, as you persuasively argue, or whether, in fact, they were quite thoughtless in the reasons why they, they gave them, th th that, in fact, they did give us a theory, not a high-level theory, not a very rich theory, but a theory of religious freedom. Which theory of religious freedom? The theory constituted by the directive 
that government is not to establish religion or prohibit the free exercise thereof. I mean, it seems to me that that, that that theory can represent a point of convergence among many more richer theories of, uh, of uh, religious liberty. And of course, one can subscribe to it on the basis of no theory of religious liberty, but simply on the basis of the jurisdictional concerns. But it does seem to me that they did give us uh, a version of a thin version, perhaps, although it doesn't seem to me so thin, of religious liberty, the one constituted by the instruction, thou shalt not establish a religion or prohibit the free exercise thereof. And the difficulty now for us is over time to struggle with the meaning of that and the Gadamari, the, the contextual meaning of that over, over time. Steve, short answer. Okay, short answer is that my construction of what they intended to do may not be right, but if it is right, I don't think you can say that they even gave us that thin theory, substantive theory of religious freedom. Uh, you would say that they gave us the notion that it's for the states to decide what to do about religious freedom, establish it, disestablish it, and a, and a whole range of other things that, that states might do, and so you can't extract even a thin substantive theory of religious freedom from that. One there, there, all right, one yeah. sentence. I mean, one sentence is that is not going to answer the question of what the federal government can do when it does regulate religion. Can it exclude people from certain religions from serving in the military, for example? Um, or can it impose neutral restrictions which make say that everybody must eat pork on the Sabbath? Um, you have to have a thin theory or some theory in order to figure out the federal controls over religious exercise. It would be interesting to continue the dialogue at the stage, but I think it's important that we get to the audience, and so we'll start over here. Thank you, my name is James Joseph. A uh, qu quick question for Professor Dorf, touching, uh, just asking you to be a little more specific on a point you touched on, namely the lessons that we obtain from history. If uh, one can speak of this at a very particular level, which most people don't pretend to do, or at a quite abstract one, let me give you an example. You can ask the question, how do we improve the situation of black inhabitants in this country? And the founders will say, who cares? And the uh, 1860s generation will say, ah, oh, well, we give them the right to vote. And 1995 will say affirmative action or some other such affirmative remedy. Or you can say, well, we can apply what Locke would have thought. And the only question that the, we can say that the founders actually did that, but when they applied the Anglo-American philosophical tradition, they simply uh, omitted the inclusion of blacks in their definition of people. So where along that continuum do you say we should learn our lessons with respect to originalism? Uh, I guess the answer I would say, and, and this, is a, I mean, this is a very difficult answer and unsatisfying, I'm sure, to you as, as it is to me, is at all points um, that, I mean, to, to pick up on what Steve Smith was saying, if it's true, I mean, for, I'm thinking now as a sort of quasi-originalist, if it's true that there really is no mind behind these questions. That is, you know, let, let's take the, the, I mean, the 14th, it seems to me that at least we have to go to the 1860s because there's an actual change in the text of the Constitution on, on, on this question. Um, but if it's true that they didn't really think out how, what the answers to that are, then you have to look to the subsequent history, it seems to me, but the whole range of that subsequent history. And there will not be a determinate answer to the question, what, is, what are the lessons of history? But that, it seems to me, is not a reason not to do it, just as the fact that original, is, original intent is sometimes indeterminate is not a reason of itself to reject originalism. Any other comment uh, from the panel? If not, we'll turn it over here. Akil? Uh, thank you, uh, General Meese. Um, my question- Speak right into the uh, microphone, okay. Akil. Akil Amar. Uh, my question is for, for Michael Dorf. I think I disagree with the two historical um, examples that you used about the 14th Amendment and the Establishment Clause. Uh, and the reason I'm gonna make this point is, like you, I think that there has to be more than just originalism. Our legal culture involves arguments not just from text and history and structure, but from precedent and, and prudence and, and natural law. But I think actually one of the best arguments for originalism is the more you study uh, history, sometimes the better the historical or structural arguments you can make, the, the more you actually understand the precedents to get all of those Fallon vectors uh, pointing in the same direction. On the 14th Amendment, Section 2, to my mind, does not say anything about what, uh, discrimi whether discrimination against women is encompassed by Section 1. What Section 2 says, uh, basically, or what, what, what the word male in Section 2 um, is all about, 
is that the 14th Amendment Section 1 is simply not about voting at all. Uh, I want to agree with what, I, since I don't always agree with what uh, Raoul Berger has said about the 14th Amendment, he did say something yesterday that I think is just absolutely true, and you let everyone on the panel this afternoon on the 14th Amendment, I think, agree, uh, from Jeff Rosen to, to Earl Maltz to, to John Harrison, that it's simply not about voting. That's what they said over and over. Now, how do they put that into the text, you might say? Well, I would say equal protection uses the word persons. And see, it's about aliens. Actually, the 15, uh, uh, Section 2 actually does talk about inhabitants, but then citizens. And aliens don't vote. It wasn't about voting. The Privileges and Immunities Clause does talk about citizens, but let's look at other clauses of the Constitution. Let's make structural arguments. Under the Privileges and Immunities Clause of Article 4, Massachusetts people don't get to vote in South Carolina. So there are textual residues of this historical claim that they make over and over again. It's simply not about voting. That's reflected in precedents like Minor versus Happersett very early on. And women, and here's the historical point, uh, say they hate Section 2, but they love Section 1. They think Section 1 protects them. The Bradwell case doesn't say women aren't encompassed by the 14th Amendment. They just say Section 1. They just say this discrimination is okay. So, so what I'm suggesting is actually the more history you study, it can help you make better textual arguments and, and understand the precedents a little better. On the Establishment Clause, just quickly to pick up on this colloquy between um, Michael Perry and Steve Smith, the argument is Congress shall make no law respecting the establishment of religion. Actually says you can't establish a national church or disestablish state churches in their five states that have established churches. Um, the lesson, if you're going to look at the, Eng uh, at the European civil wars, is basically one of local option. Curious regio, aeus religio. That's a different principle. Uh, from a pure separation. It's what, now, maybe things change after the 14th Amendment, and then we'd have to look at that. But then the final point uh, on this is, and here's how you can make that as a textual point. Congress shall make no law. You can now see the connection between that and the language of the Necessary and Proper Clause. Congress shall have power to make all law. It's the same kind of a phrasing and really sounding in federalism. There's no enumerated power here. So the more history you know, actually sometimes the more interesting structural and textual arguments you can make too in this effort to, to be a Fallon-esque and, and Bobbitt-esque and so that the different kinds of legal arguments converge. Okay, we'll uh, probably have several people want to comment. Michael, you start. Right. Um, I, I perfectly agree with the general point. That is that I, I certainly think that one can use originalist sources to say that the lesson of history is, in fact, do what the framers thought. On the specific questions, I do think that my, my point was not that through the Section 2 of the 14th Amendment, the framers meant to say anything at all about the scope of uh, equal protection in, in Section 1. My point, rather, was that we get a window into their thinking on Section 1 via Section 2. That is, they thought it perfectly fine, despite the fact that they're talking, that they're uh, enacting a principle of equal protection. When they talk about voting, which is something they're trying to, they're doing something about, to say, no problem, women can't vote. Uh, and that the reason I suspect that in Bradwell the court doesn't say anything about Section 2 is it would be overkill. To them, it's just obvious that women do not have the same kind of status as men, and that's exactly what the, the, the kind of unquestioned assumption that underlies Section 2. If you're shaking your head, we could probably continue that conversation at another point. As to the Establishment Clause, I think you, you may well be right. It's, it's the particular uh, illustration isn't that important to me. I think the best illustration of this point, though, uh, in terms of the lessons of history, is the the um, the lesson, lessons of history answer uh, Richard Epstein's point, uh, which is take the Great Depression, right? The conventional account, um, a nice version of which Larry Lessig has in the a recent issue of the Stanford Law Review of why the 1937 court is being faithful to the framers intent is because there has been a lesson of history that the way to translate the framers value and text into the modern context is uh, I, I, no, I was hoping no. I was hoping to bring you into this anyway I'm not, I'm not going to make this argument now, but Good. You, can, you, can, you, can, you, can have, you can have the discussion with Larry Lessig, who I assume is somewhere within the city. Uh, <laughs> He's actually hiding at an unknown address. No. <laughs> Any other comment? 
Yeah, I mean, I, I think that's exactly the argument. I have not understood, nor has anyone ever explained, for example, why it is by virtue of the fact that you have more commerce and more trade and more movement, you need more federal regulation rather than less. I mean, what has one learned from history under those circumstances? It's that concentrated powers yield monopoly results that stifle innovation. That's what we knew in 1787, and that's what we knew by 1937. So it seems to me that what you've done is not to sort of understand what's going on, unless you'd want to say, well, gee, if John Locke were around in 1937, he'd recognize that he made a big mistake when he wrote chapter five of the second treatise, and he'd start over again. I think that's the only kind of lesson you learned. I mean, I think the basic and the simple point that we have is that the complexity in the introduction of new and complicated industrial structures of all kinds of descriptions make federalism more viable, because the truth about the matter is the more advanced the civilization, the smaller the fraction of its resources in a well-regulated society need to be devoted through government action. And the larger fraction has to be devoted through private contractual arrangements. You need in a primitive state to spend enormous amounts of resources on self-defense on the one hand and on the maintenance of order. But in a sensible state, you can keep the criminal law confined to those original functions in relatively narrow fraction, which means that there should be a smaller part of the GMP devoted to government rather than otherwise. That's the lesson I think you ought to learn from history. And if you learn that lesson, what you do is you would say that the guys who, the feckless fellows who decided the 1937 cases got it all just plain backwards. I just think it's a little odd to refer to the Great Depression as more commerce. Well, no, I mean, look, I, I will tell you actually a story. No, I won't tell you the story. <laughs> oh, but there's a, there's a great story about uh, on how this goes on. For those who want to hear the story, see him during the break. Uh, we, we have about, uh, about uh, eight and a half minutes left of this session. Uh, and so I'd ask you to make your questions short. And may I ask the panel to make the answers even shorter? Thank you. I'm Bob Snyderman from Urbana. The question is a combination of remarks of uh, Professor Epstein and Professor uh, Dorff. Uh, Professor Epstein uh, commented about how Mindless people may have, uh, or somewhat unintentionally, come up with a better product than they intended in the Bill of Rights, in uh, uh, having broader scope than perhaps they realized. Whereas uh, Professor Dorff spoke about how the people drafting the 14th Amendment uh, may not have intended to create uh, equal protection for women, given their mindset is revealed in Section 2, but doesn't the text in Section 1 seem to encompass women within the definition of all persons? I thought that point of his was uh, well taken and, and a significant one, though I certainly don't want to be Professor Amar on uh, the business of the 14th Amendment. I'm wondering if one of the originalists on the panel would address Professor Dorff's point. That is, if it's true that it appears that the people who wrote Section two did not view women as fully equal to men and this aspect, uh, equality under the law, giving a pretty clear indication of their mindset, then uh, must we limit ourselves to the text only or can we go beyond the text to look at their thinking at the time as we interpret section one? I think that's a very hard question on how to do it. Principles of equality, I think, are much more difficult and more slippery than those which have the discrete substantive content. But my first instinct about it is that I think that in the early discourse, there was a sharp distinction between political and civil rights. The second clause there has to do with the voting side of it. Much of the things that we're talking about now were not voting kinds of issues, but were rather issues of civil capacity and so forth. And I think it's quite conceivable to say that the norm of equality would apply in these other areas, even though it did not apply here. And a nice question to ask about this, to figure out how you would solve it, and Akil will know more than I about it, is there was a lot of questions for example, about the capacity of married women to enter contracts, which was under enormous flux at that particular point in time. Could one say that after the passage of the 14th Amendment that a state which denied married women the same right of contractual freedom as to married men was a violation of the Equal Protection Clause? I'm quite comfortable with the result that it is, in fact, a violation. But um, I would like uh, other people who know more about it to, to answer, because I do believe that Akil is right. Generally speaking, knowing more is better than knowing less. And um, uh, <laughs> I would agree with that. Um, but uh, And there's a tendency, particularly for folks like myself, who are sometimes scholars, to say more than we know. Um, so I will just leave it at that. <laughs> Sandy. Yeah, this is primarily for Richard Epstein. It, Oops. it seems to me that the question you've raised really goes back in part to the parole evidence rule. Yes. That when you say that the words 
uh, Congress shall pass no law abridging freedom of speech, or I expect a clause you're especially fond of, no state shall pass any law impairing the obligation of contracts. Yeah. What you seem to be saying is what that really means, except when it's really necessary to abridge speech or impair a contract. And do you say that out of a theory of original intent? That is, you have some reason to think this is what the framers really meant by using the term no law, or does your argument sound in political theory that it really is quite crazy to say that under no conceivable circumstances should Congress ever abridge speech? That is an indefensible notion, I think, of the First Amendment, um, just as I think it's indefensible to say under no conceivable circumstances can a contract be impaired, so that you say, Regard, you're not interested. I mean, contrary to what Akhil suggested, you really don't have to go into research as to what the framers really thought no law meant, because you interpret the Constitution sensibly to say that even where the language appears to the ordinary speaker to be as categorical as possible, you read in an exception. And then obviously the analogy of the parole evidence rule is when you decide in construing the contract that does really seem to be clear to take in evidence about what the parties okay. meant. I mean, parole evidence is a wonderful place to begin. And I think that people who spend more time worrying about ordinary contract would do better in constitutional interpretation. And I'll just draw the following distinction. Under the parole evidence rule, it's much easier to get in evidence with respect to a generalized custom over standardized usage that has grown up in a certain trade or in a certain practice than it is to get in evidence of individual expressions of what it is I did or did not mean in a particular case. And so when you're starting to look at the kinds of parole that you take in, it seems to me that you ought to be worrying about that second point. The kind of evidence I would do is, is, is actually much more conformable to the civil law tradition, European tradition, than the American one, in which they always thought there was a general part, an allgemeine tile was the German expression, which was necessarily imported into all statutes, which basically said that there was a class of generalized, excusing and justifying conditions, which had to be expressly and emphatically negated before it wasn't thought to be part of the doctrine. So I actually wrote a paper some years ago saying, if you want to figure out how to interpret the Constitution in 1776, look at the lecture sequelia that the Romans passed, and you will see that they had all sorts of implications which were precisely parallel to the ones that we have here. This suggests in turn that basically my inclinations are those of a structuralist rather than an original intent guy. I'm much more of a basic fundamental meaning guy. I don't think, however, that it necessarily leads to a, a contradiction with the kinds of things that Akhil talked about, because in my sort of casual readings, I'm not a thorough scholar in this area, the sense that I've often developed is that the understanding of the general part as being a part of constitutional interpretation was something which was historically undertained and historically maintained. So that I think it would be wrong to say that the structural elements were something of which the founders were ignorant, and therefore we have to import it in over their general objections. I think that they basically were perfectly comfortable with that. And then the issue is what universe of moral discourse do you go to get the structuralism in? And I have little doubt that it's the same universe that generated the original text, which is a basic libertarian instinct which protects freedom of X, Y, and Z, contract and property. And to the extent that you try to read the as it were, the exceptions congruent with the basic prohibitions, I think that you get a pretty good result. And where we've done well in constitutional interpretation, mainly First Amendment and speech, it's very close to that model. Where we've done badly in property is because we've used the exceptions to change the fundamental theory from a libertarian one to an organic one. The single most damning and stupid statement in the history of constitutional law is the sentence of Oliver Wendell Holmes in his Lochner dissent, where he said, our constitution doesn't choose between a system of basic individual liberties and one in which the man has an organic relationship to a state. That was the whole battle. And to say that we regard it as a thing that is essentially unimportant is to simply trivialize all that was done with respect to the organization of basic structure. Okay, over here. Uh, my name is Dominic Panzetta and my question is for Professor Dorf. You referred to levels of generality of intent and in your book on reading the Constitution you referred to the Ninth Amendment as a rule of construction which affirmatively commands generalization of the rights which are enumerated. My problem with that is a grammatical reading of the Ninth Amendment. It says the enumeration of certain rights shall not be construed. It doesn't say the rights shall not be construed. It says the enumeration shall not be construed to deny or disparage others. So it would almost point to, they are almost seem to say, if read, that we have to 
if we're somebody who is trying to follow it, that there would be separate rights and that it does not refer to generalizing the rights which are enumerated. Could you please respond to that? Sure. Um, the, I think the point that I was, uh, I should be clear, it's a text that has two authors, and so uh, there, there may have been, you know. It's what, the what other the, guy. What, what the, no, 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 no that, that's not my, 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 my attempt is not to, to pass it off on Larry. My, my, my claim is, though, that, you know, what I meant is an interesting question, right? It invokes all the issues of this uh, colloquium. Uh, but nonetheless, I will engage in that kind of, of an enterprise. What I think we were trying to say there uh, is consistent broadly with what you're saying, which is that the Ninth Amendment is, does not affirmatively count as an argument for recognizing unenumerated rights. What it does is it rules out a certain strategy, uh, it rules out a certain kind of argument for not recognizing unenumerated rights. There may well be other reasons not to recognize uh, unenumerated rights. Uh, so for example, the Hugo Black argument about judicial restraint is not an argument in any way ruled out by the Ninth Amendment. It's just that one can't use the uh, inclusio unius exclusio alterius argument. That, that's, that's the point that we're trying to make from the Ninth Amendment. Now, you can then spin that out and say, well, why do they not want you to do that? Maybe it's because they have some underlying uh, conception that there really are unenumerated rights and, and it's proper for interpreters of the Constitution to recognize them. But that, I agree, doesn't follow necessarily from the text of the Ninth Amendment. I would like to continue with the last two questions, but stern looks from the sponsors of the conference indicate that our time has more than elapsed. Uh, but uh, may I ask all of you to uh, return in 10 minutes, uh, taking a short break. But before that, please join me in thanking our panelists.